So yesterday I talked about Shivers 2, which is uh, Richard and Sue have introduced, um, adult cohorts mainly. And today I'll tell you about um, Shivers 3, which is part of a program that we call Da Vinci. And this is an NIH program, uh, collaborative, uh, large grant to ask the question of how initial exposure to influenza in infants, either by infection or by vaccination, modulates the immune response to subsequent influenza exposures. And this really grew out of a, a sort of epidemiological observation that early influenza exposures may set up the entire course of your life in terms of uh, influenza responsiveness. And our hypothesis was that if there is imprinting mechanistically, it has to be some combination of bias selection, recruitment, retention, and differentiation of the B cells and T cells that make up your response in those initial exposures. And so that's what we needed to capture. And so um, I, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to speed through um, and just try to give you some highlights of what we're trying to do. Uh, the technology that we had when we wrote the proposal has changed so much, and even from what I showed yesterday, we, we just have such a higher resolution of what we're able to do, and I, I want to convey some of that and how powerful um, the samples from these programs and, and shivers in particular are going to be. And so this is uh, um, uh, some data from the what we're calling the first exposure study. Uh, so some folks from the lab here, and then uh, Rob Metalman, who's over at the table over there that uh, led this work. Um, he made these slides, and so he's not in any of the pictures, but um, <laughs> he, he is the leader. Um, and so the idea of the first exposure study was really to get at this first question of what's the difference between getting vaccinated or infected first, and if you're infected, does it matter what strain you are infected with in terms of uh, the type of immune response you, you generate? And so um, we uh, selected samples from Aubrey's cohort that you're going to hear about next. Uh, so uh, baseline uh, PBMC samples, hopefully prior to any exposure that were taken after birth of the infants enrolled in the cohort. And then a second sample that's at least a convalescent sample after vaccination, infection, or no exposure, just so that we could uh, make sure that our, our longitudinal sampling was, um, was stable. Uh, and the idea is to obviously expand this uh, to the Shivers cohort and to the Los Angeles cohort, which is the third cohort in Da Vinci uh, run by Pia Panaraj, who's also here and you're going to hear from. And so we had to um, select these uh, subjects to match on um, you know, various demographic factors, uh, uh, sex, uh, HLAs, which is critical for how your T cells see uh, your, um, the targets of their immune response. Um, and uh, we had a mix of H1 and H3. And so um, I'm not going to belabor the technical points, but just to say, again, if you saw the talk yesterday, we used what we call sort of a functional assay, where we took the cells and we, we challenged them with virus or with peptides and asked them to respond. Uh, and now what we can do is actually just take the cells directly from the subject and interrogate them using a combination of specialized reagents and genomic sequencing to profile at really high resolution at the single cell level, everything that's happening inside the cell transcriptionally. So we measure thousands of genes at once using, this is a 10X genomics platform. And with specialized reagents, we, we learn the target of those T cells or B cells uh, at the, um, simultaneously. We also get the sequence of the T cell receptors and B cell receptors in those cells. And again, not to belabor the technical details, but that's going to be the real trick and power of these studies longitudinally going forward. And I'll try to put that in context uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so T cells only see very, very small pieces of the virus. And we all see different parts of every virus. This is what makes understanding T cell immunity somewhat more complex than B cell immunity, because the parts of the virus that we see are determined by this protein complex called HLA, which is it's the transplant antigens that you're matching when you get a, an organ transplant. And so for every person, we have to construct a, a custom kit of tools to interrogate their T cell responses. And again, this technology um, existed, but was incredibly expensive when we wrote the proposal. So each, each line here is uh, an antigen from flu virus that's in the context of a particular HLA, which is, is given by this code here. And then this is given, this is telling us which peptide from flu virus, which little piece of protein uh, is able to be seen. Uh, so this technology, when we wrote the proposal, each one of these probably cost about two or three thousand dollars to make, and so you can do the math here to see how much it would have cost just to do this experiment. It's it's still pretty expensive, but it's much cheaper now, so it actually is um, feasible. Uh, and then we can put these through uh, this sequencing platform where we get the sequence uh, of the transcriptome, so all the RNA and uh, the T cell receptor and or B cell receptor in every cell from uh, these patients that we analyze. And so this is a gigantic data set that I think Rob acquired in 
October, November. Um, and it will probably take us another six months to a year to actually fully analyze this. Uh, and we'll, we'll be adding more samples. Um, but um, here's a first look at some of the results. Again, some more serious people. Uh, you can tell because their arms are folded. Uh, <laughs> and um, so this is what data, uh, a high level scan of this data looks like. We call these um, UMAPs. They're just plots to try to cluster cells together that are doing the same thing. And so uh, it's based on the transcription of the cell, so the RNA in the cell. Every dot on this uh, image here is a single cell from one of our subjects uh, that had been vaccinated or infected or was a control. Uh, and so this just shows that um, in these sort of different continents of cells, um, we have a mix of all of our subjects. So that's good. That means we're not kind of biased technically. Uh, and then the way they're separated is based on their function. And so you get B cells off together. You get all the T cells off together. Um, and you get uh, various innate cells off together. Um, and so uh, then we can also see where we were able to sequence T cell receptors and B cell receptors at the same time. So there's hundreds of thousands of cells represented here from all of the subjects that we looked at. So real briefly, in my, in my uh, four remaining minutes, I'm gonna <coughs> um, tell you some of what we found. Um, so this is just looking at the innate cells, so the macrophages, the neutrophils, the things that respond right away. Uh, this wasn't actually really a core focus of the program, but it's something that we kind of get for free doing all of the other stuff that we're doing. And uh, it actually showed us some of the most striking differences. This is weeks after the infection or the vaccination, and we actually see segregation based on, in, in sort of cell state, based on whether somebody was infected or vaccinated. So that innate uh, in, in these young infants, that innate compartment is already changed just by a single infection or a single vaccination in a way that we can distinguish these groups from each other. But we're at T-cell lab, and so we really want to focus on the T-cell response. So now we're zooming in just on the T-cells. And again, in this kind of continent map here, the T-cells that are naive, meaning they've never seen an antigen before, they're not doing anything, and we can tell that from their RNA, are sitting up here, sort of in the northeast. And the T cells that are active are down here, sort of more to the southwest. These are the ones that have seen antigen and have, have done something. And we can look at the T cell receptors in each of those cells, and if we see the same T cell receptor in, most, in, in more than one cell, we know that that cell's divided, which is what happens when you have a T cell response. It comes in and it starts proliferating like mad. And so um, all of our big clones are here in the southwest where the T cells have done something. So that makes good sense. And we're seeing actual expansion of the T cell response in these infants to their first vaccination or infection. What we get for free here by, by analyzing the T cell receptor uh, response is, in addition to looking at the flu response, we've been curating T cell receptors to lots of infections over the years. We have a lot more work to do on this. This is sort of the, our white whale and, and T cell receptor biology. But we already know a lot of receptors for other infections like CMV, EBV, um, and uh, other cell types, and we can see those responses in some of these subjects, so that they've been infected with CMV already, even though they're, they're quite young, or EBV, uh, which is the virus that causes mono. Um, and again, those cells are there in that same region where the activated, expanded cells are. Um, we can also use just that T cell receptor sequence uh, based on our knowledge of what flu T cells look like and find um, cells in the naive compartment and the active compartment. This compartment down here is CD4 cells, and I'm not talking about them just for the sake of time. And so my last little data slide um, just shows you um, the power of this resolution. So now what we're overlaying is that code of the specialized reagents we use to look at exactly each little peptide that these cells are responding to. We can see the cells from our uninfected or unvaccinated individuals up here. They're clone size of one. They're sitting naive. We're getting, waiting for that subject to eventually uh, see flu antigen, but otherwise they haven't done anything. And then we can see the cells responding in patients that have been vaccinated or, or infected, kind of moving down this trajectory where the cells are getting activated, sort of intermediate here, and then massively expanding. So the size of the dot there is the clone size of that cell. And so we can see that even in these youngest infants, they just get an exposure, either a vaccination or infection, they can mount these massive uh, clonal expansion responses. And so this, this is the first time I think we've ever been able to look at this resolution in these infant responses. And there's been a lot of wild speculation about what these look like, that maybe they're defective in some way. And we can see a lot of variation. So this, we're gonna have to add a lot more subjects, but there's some subjects that respond really, really well. And then there's some subjects that respond in a somewhat potentially disappointing manner. Um, the other thing this lets us do is um, these subjects that have only naive CD8 T cells up here, we know they've never seen antigen before. They don't have any kind of um, specific response. 
And um, this is very helpful because it's actually very hard to, to figure out the history of these infants because a lot of them still have maternal antibodies. So the normal way we would look and say, oh, you don't have any antibodies to flu, um, in, even in this selection we had a lot of confounding, but this kind of became our gold standard of whether or not um, uh, they had had any exposure history. And now, now we know the code these subjects are using to look at flu. And we can watch them for the next seven years, uh, hopefully, or more of the study, if the NIH is still on, um, and, um, and track that exact same response over potentially decades of their lives and watch what happened when that cell arose when they were six months old, expanded, became a memory cell, and maybe when they're 10 years old and they get flu again, we can watch what happens again and really understand the, the molecular mechanism of imprinting. Uh, and so I'll end there and just say, uh, you know, we have a lot more work to do just on that data set, and then we want to bring in many more samples. So we're continuing this clonotypic analysis uh, and diving into more of the comparisons of the baseline versus first exposure and directly between infection and vaccination. We have some hints uh, that these are making a different response and that you might want more of one than the other, uh, but uh, lots more work to do there. And uh, include more longitudinal samples to sort of see the effect of these imprinted responses. And of course, we want to add the well Kiwi samples and the children's uh, Los Angeles cohorts because this is incredible human diversity we have across all these cohorts. And the, the rules might be very different. The previous exposures might be very different. Um, and uh, a few other uh, things to, to do. But I, I want to highlight one point that um, has been being made all day and, 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 and Nikki's made a few times. Uh, but there's an enormous amount of metadata that you all are collecting in this cohort and the power of, of how long uh, these longitudinal cohorts have been going on. Um, and we're collecting in parallel to that sort of the immune history as encoded in, in these immune repertoires. And it's very difficult for a human being to look at these immune repertoires and all of this other data and put it together and, and say something meaningful. But computers can look at all of that data and put it together and, and find um, new signals. So if, if, you know, children are on a particular diet or are, um, have some other exposure, RSV, that we didn't even detect, we'll see that in the immune repertoire and you might have it in the record as RSV and we can now put those data together and understand what those um, differences mean. So I'll end there. This is the whole um, uh, Da Vinci team uh, and um, the folks from the lab I tried to acknowledge as we went through, but um, they're listed here.